bankers and business owners. <laughs> Yay! Happy Casual Friday. <laughs> Very casual. <laughs> Oh, look, Bruce is MIA, but I see a little new uh, visitor in his background there. Oh, yeah, look at that. He logged in. So, actually, it's not Bruce in the Hangout today. It's <laughs> it's the monkey. <laughs> Standing in for Bruce. The message is, talk to the monkey. Is that what today is about? <sighs> so, do we have a subject? today? Um, I was going to rant about the gas prices, but if you have something you want to talk about, feel free. Uh, yeah, I was going to rant about that. I'm just curious on how people's managing to get all this stuff done and keep their schedule under control. Well, my this, secret this has is been a no real struggle. struggle. <laughs> hey, Bruce. Hi. Morning. Hi, Bruce. My, my secret is no kids and a very understanding wife. <laughs> and you're up all night long. Too. And I'm up and all night, and I get up early in the morning. So I just right. so no sleep. That's the other secret. Yeah. Well, maybe like what's some tips? Like I use you know Google Calendar and web-based email, and you know I try to automate what I can, but I'm obviously not. I'm um, having trouble. The calendar is the key to me, honestly. I mean, all joking aside. I, the calendar is a key because that's where I just outline this is exactly what I'm going to be doing at this time. And I include things like personal stuff, you know, so like if I want to go, you know, if I want to schedule some downtime so I can balance and relax, that goes on the calendar. We already saw the monkey while you went MIA, Bruce. <laughs> we figured he was a stand in for you. Yeah. Nope. Coffee. Ah, uh, got it. Well, Roxanne, I have the same problem you do. I mean, I, I don't have enough hours in the day to get all the things that I need done. Um, I enjoy what I do for a job, but I also enjoy my personal life. I enjoy my time with my family. So I think Seth is right. The calendars are the key. Um, yeah, I have no personal life anymore. Yeah, yeah, I like I want my that. Life back. <laughs> all right, I'll take you all back to the shelter. <laughs> you lie. <laughs> so, do you guys send stuff out to clients to, uh, like, ahead of time marketing stuff to try to get things on a regular schedule? That's one thing we would want to do, but I've not done because I, uh, the work is just so. Well, it's been up here. <laughs> I can't. Get, I'm not even getting dips and valleys, but like, I want to get um, more consistent. You know, like monthly stuff reviews or quarterly stuff, so maybe there isn't so many big cleanup jobs, you know, at one time. I, uh, I have a hard time getting the clients on board with a regular schedule. I try and set up with clients to meet at the same time every week uh, with a few clients that I can do that with, and even that becomes challenging. It seems like every other week they need to change the time anyway. Right. I agree. I, I think that's the biggest challenge. I think Josh had some input, insights on this the last time we talked. Um, it might have been on Bruce's Hangout, actually. Um, just about sending out emails at certain times, like you said, um, when it's time to do it. Twice a day. Meeting. Actually, three times a day <laughs> is when I do my emails. Seriously, I do it first thing in the morning. That's the first thing I do when I get to my computer is clean out my inbox. Then at some time, usually around lunchtime, that's the next time I'm doing emails and also callbacks. People I've got to call back. And then at the end of the day, like around 5, 6 o'clock in the evening, I, I, I come through my inbox again. And then I don't do that every day because some days I just get too busy. And so I often miss the end of the day portion, but I don't worry about it because I know I'm going to pick it up at the beginning of the following day. And even still, sometimes I let it go for a couple of days. Like last night, I, I had I got home and I realized I had a ton of emails to go through, and I sat here and I plowed through them. And I was getting back to people that emailed me as long as three days ago, and just saying sorry for the delay and getting back to you. And then here's your response, you know. And I try not to beat myself up about it, and you know, because I just I look at it and I say, you know what, I'm just one person, and uh, if you want a fast response, pay me. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like time maybe management. Maybe a better, yeah, time management. Maybe a better question would be if you're gonna get help 
Oh. How many of you guys have brought in help? And how did you do that without pulling your hair out? Because it's like, it takes me so long to train somebody to do the most basic things, it seems. And you invest that time, and then they're gone. you got to start all over again. Well, I'm, you know, I'll be honest and right up front, I've been uh, mm -hmm, sending a lot of bookkeeping work Adrian's way. Mm -hmm. And Adrian's been helping me get the bookkeeping work done, and I just kind of oversee it and kind of manage the timeline on it, and, and we work together, and Adrian's great. So it's, uh, my answer to you on that, if you have bookkeeping work, is talk to Adrian or Tina, because Tina's been helping me with some yep. bookkeeping work as well. Yes, yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Together, eh? So of course I'm going to try some stuff out here, I think, too. Yeah, I mean, what I mean, we we have a small a small team, a growing team, uh, doing exactly that as Seth just described. Um, you know, it's it's a mutual benefit for everybody. Um, you know, we've got the facilities to do it. We've got the facilities to work remotely, as you know, I always keep saying now. Um, you know, and, it, and to be honest, it works. It works real well. Um, I enjoy you know working with other bookkeepers around the country. Um, you know, I can provide. The facilities for them to grow because I've got the team to do the work, um, and then they've got their client that they're, they're fronting their clients. And that means that you know people like yourself can go out there and find new clients, larger clients, uh, more complex clients. You know, because you've got a team like ourselves behind. You know that that works real well. And besides, we're a fun, we're a fun team, so. <laughs> So how do you guys manage that? You know, do you just uh, send all the, the files and you know information about the client over, and then let them do their thing, and then you just pick up, review it afterwards to finish up with the client? How do you do it? Or seamless? And, you know what I mean? Everybody's got what they need. Uh, Seth, do you want to take that one first? <laughs> you are repeating the question. Sorry, I got distracted. I'm trying to get somebody here into the hangout for the first time. What was when the question? When you're training, you know, when you're sending work out, like how do you do it in a seamless way that everyone has what they need to do the job in a, you know, share file. Time. Share and file. Then, I, no, I, I, I know, I know about the logistics of getting it back, back and forth. I guess, but is there like a checklist to make sure that everybody gets what they need, and you know, the client necessarily know you're not doing the work, right? So how do you manage all this? Um, no, I try to be pretty transparent with the client that I'm not the actual one doing the work. Um, but usually, the, the I mean, all these jobs, the first place it's going to start is give me all your bank statements and give me your QuickBooks file so we can start there because that's where 90% of the bookkeeping goes through is the bank accounts. Right. So what I do is, I again, I set up the share file folder. I make them give me access to the statements or they have to provide me with the PDFs. And then I name everything. I organize the actual the actual files on the web because I have a naming convention that makes it really easy to. I mean, Adrian, am I wrong? Is it not very easy to find everything? And is it not super organized when I turn it over to you? No, it, it, I mean you are the most organized person. <laughs> it's much easier when we get things from Seth because they've been they've been pre-organized. Seth, um, you know that works. That that he knows how to do it. Seth, what's your naming convention? I'd be curious because I have my own and it worked well for me, but that's the one thing that I think across the board everyone needs is something that's uniform so they all understand. Right. So the, the way I name a bank account would be it starts with the name of the bank. Like let's say it's Wells Fargo. It'll be Wells Fargo, the last four digits of the account number for that account. So that deals with when there are multiple accounts at the same bank. And then the next piece in the name is going to be the statement ending date in the following format. It's the four-digit year, dash the month in double-digit format, and dash the day in double-digit format. This makes things sort and line up beautifully, especially if I'm going across a calendar year when I'm listing the documents. They sort perfectly, and it's so easy and so clear to figure out what you're looking at and where it is when you're looking for it. Uh, and the, the the other way that I mean that's I mean obviously naming conventions are, are critical you know um, being but I think as well the the communications between uh, you know someone like yourself or in, in the case of me and Seth you know we talk very regularly you on know Skype. We're, yeah. we're on yeah we're on Skype um, sometimes Google Plus but mostly Skype you know so if there are issues that come up or questions we can immediately get them answered. Um, you know that, and, and that again is, you know, facilitates the uh, the speed that we can, you know, get through a hell of a lot of work. 
Um, you know, we're all very um, aware of how long it takes to do bookkeeping. But the closer you are to, you know, the, the source of the data, if you like, that can uh, that speeds things up. But again, you know, the use of share file is very is very good that, that Seth is using. Um, you know, because we that means we we're effectively having the same data in the same place at the same time. Uh, alternatively, we could be using our virtual servers. You know, which you know we intend to do, but you know that that's the next step for us. Uh, for, for Seth and, and I. Um, but I think, you know, I see what we're doing as almost like a bookkeeping bureau uh, for other bookkeepers and for other teams out there. You know, we are the operations engine and uh, end of what we're doing. And, um, you know, if, if people do need help out there, you know, that's what we're set up to do. And you know, the other thing is the folder structure too, which is kind of a, a level up from the naming convention, is I have a standard folder structure where I have the client name, of course, and usually it's the name of the company dash and the contact name. That's how I name my folder. So that it's because it, a lot of times and I'm always thinking when I set these things up in terms of when I'm searching for it, what I'm likely to be searching for. So I'm often searching by the name of my primary contact at that company, not by the name of the company itself. And sometimes it's the company. So I like to have both in the name of the root folder. Within that, I've got a folder called banking. Inside of the banking folder are all your bank statements and all your credit card statements for any bank accounts and credit cards that they have on the books. Then usually I'll have a folder, if I'm going this deep with the client, if I'm actually you know, getting and entering their bills, I'll have a folder called bills, and within that, there's a folder for every vendor. And I get a scan of every bill, and it goes in its appropriate folder there. And then the bills naming convention is the name of the company, the payee, Right? Just like I used to do in my physical files where I'd have a folder for that payee, I'd do the same thing virtually. So I have a folder based on the name of the payee. Within that, each bill gets a name based on the payee and then the date of the bill right, in the same format. You know, a quadruple digit year, double digit month and day for sorting. And then further to that, in the, still in the name, I will put the, uh, the amount of the bill. Because sometimes I'm searching for the file that's got a bill for a certain amount, and that helps me find it super fast. Because now I know, because I know I name them that way, I can search my files for a bill based on that bill's amount, which is oftentimes how I'm looking for it. Oh, okay, that's cool. I like that. I do almost exactly the same thing, Seth. I like the idea of the contact name with the with the um, client business name on the folders, and yeah, then. I do that. Top of that, I only keep a year's worth of information in those banking, billing, invoicing, um, credit card is another one I have, folders. Um, and then at the end of the year, I'll create another folder like last year would be 2011 and close everything and put it in there. And then mm -hmm. I have archives, so to say, but only the current uh, folders open and working on them. Yeah, that's, you know, I use colors too. <laughs> like All right, I think it's time we bring our resident pundit into the conversation <laughs> because I see he's typing in the chat and asking some very good questions on this topic. Uh, Doug, do you want to chime in and just kind of voice what you've written in the chat? <laughs> good morning. I'm just barely here today. <laughs> Really, we are we are we are pushing really hard this year to get the conference all together. So that's that's my excuse for being half witted. But anyway, yeah. So I I mean I like all of what you said, but the underlying assumption I think is that these files, which are probably PDFs or maybe even Excel doc, whatever files they are, are on a hard drive in Windows. You know. And so that kind of like is old world thinking. So uh, the organization part is perfect. I'm just trying to say, well, what about if we a get them OCR on the as soon as you scan them in, they should be searchable. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you could um, eliminate the need for some of that naming or and some of the things like the the amount. Even with that, though, I still like to name it that way because I'm not always searching. Sometimes I'm in the folder just directly looking for something. Just browsing, yeah. 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 That, that brings up something. You remember when we went paperless, what we gave up? <clears throat> I can, in fact, where was it? Uh, yeah, look at Roxanne behind her there. See, she can she can look around and let's stay on her 
on her page for a minute there. So see her black folder uh, file cabinet behind her. She can turn around, open that thing up, and her eyeballs can do so much so quickly to find documents. And sometimes you're not only finding uh, for a specific thing, but you're finding for the absence of a whole, you know, you're, you're eliminating all this stuff you see that can't be it, so I don't have it kind of thing. Our eyes are so trained for stuff like that. So this going paperless is, um, uh, it has a whole new thinking component to that. So, of course, that's why Seth's so good at this is because his thinking is just so organized in, in terms of mostly, digital content. Most things are digital. That's like the archives of, you know, we have a client folder that is paper for all the session reports, and most of those get scanned in, but not all of them. And so those are, you know, the inactive people or yeah. some things that, you know, you just, you, there's certain things I want hard copies of. I need to, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like all my scribbles. Well, <laughs> and, and I don't have time to scan in. Yeah, I mean, because, cause yeah, I mean, like, I've got, you know, i got a desk full of stuff here. And yeah. I, we all do because that's just so much faster. And will I scan this in or will I probably just either type some of it into various things at various times, you know, so we're never going to get completely paperless. Um, the but smart yeah, vault just, concept is an interesting one. I, you know, I didn't realize, I knew that they were document storage. I didn't realize that they also integrated with QuickBooks such that you could actually attach documents. QuickBooks has its own built-in document attachment, but from what I just discovered talking with Dania this week, yeah. Um, it sounds like their uh, feature is a little more powerful than the one that's internal to QuickBooks, especially since it's in the cloud and QuickBooks took it local. Can yeah, somebody, actually, they, can somebody... start, they innovated that whole concept of attaching a document to transactions or list items or employee records or whatever. So that's what Smart Vault basically was founded on that concept. And then Intuit developed this attached document, <laughs> basically copying everything they did. So this is one of these real like ah I just really hate when it when there's innovation in our marketplace and what happens is Intuit or Microsoft or Apple or whatever comes along and just says oh we can do that too thereby stifling the innovation of these small guys so but you're right Seth yes I we use it all the time and any document that comes in here I just gotta you know this is gonna go to an employee record I you know so I just scan it in here. I, when I scan it in, I save the PDF to a folder on my hard drive, which is a map drive to my Smart Vault inbox. So it goes there, and then when Joy comes into QuickBooks, uh, she will see, uh, I'll just have her go to that particular employee record, and she'll just uh, attach document by looking at the inbox, and there it is, and I've named it like you name it, and it just gets attached electronically to the to the employee record. So if we're ever looking for anything about that employee, it's just go into QuickBooks, go to the employee record, and see all the documents that are attached. Hey, Doug, this yeah. is Dennis. When do you what do you distinguish between attaching something to Bill.com versus attaching something to SmartVault? That is a never-ending conundrum. <laughs> um, in fact, I have. So the answer is it, you. Um, <laughs> It's either or, and I would like <laughs> mm -hmm. to think of just one place. Um, so everything that's AP is a scan uh, or or Excel or whatever that, that goes into Bill.com. Everything that's employee related would be Smart Vault. Everything that's contract related, everything that's you know basically not AP is going into Smart Vault. Um, I've talked to Renee a lot about this at, at Bill.com. I said, "Look, you got to just tell me, you got to give me a feature that says uh, uh, like a setting, and it says that it, that would tell Bill.com where my document storage is. And I want to choose Smart Vault. And uh, so far, they have been unwilling to get together. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, so yeah, that's a problem. Uh, does anybody else use Bill.com and Smart Vault? Anybody use Bill.com? No, a lot of us use Bill.com. We love Bill.com and Apple. I don't think, I don't think Roxanne is right. No, I, I do different stuff than you guys, so it's just not working to my practice. I've recommended it a lot. Yeah. I just don't have a. I don't use it. No. Do you use it, Gina? 
Uh, no, actually, I'm using my my bank billing. It's already been set up um, before I even knew about Bill.com, and I just never really took the time to change yeah. or whatever. And yeah. you are Dennis, right? Pardon me. You are using it. Bill.com, yeah. Yeah. Bruce, are you doing it yet? I I love Bill.com. Yes, I am doing it. <laughs> yeah. And Bruce I is on their accountant's plan. I haven't gotten around to uh, switching to it yet myself. Yeah. And I love the accountant's thing. A Adrian, for the bookkeeping service, I assume you're just all over it? No, uh, right now we are not. Um, <laughs> but we are uh, very close. You know, Seth, Seth is being very convincing to us you know, as, as a uh, Bill.com uh, unofficial salesperson. So, yeah. yeah. So I think I think you know we'll we'll certainly see ourselves moving. We we do recommend it to our clients. But yeah. We don't we don't eat our own dog food on that right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, we will. has Seth told you that uh, Bill.com is my new dog? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm I'm yeah I'm gathering that. <laughs> well, it is. I mean, and you know I I'm just totally bought in. But so my use case is just I think so typical. As a business owner, forget being giving client services for a minute. Just as a business owner, we get all these invoices from vendors, and then we bring them in, and then what do we have to do? We have to pay them. Well, enter bill, beep, beep, you know, and then set it aside on paper, and then <laughs> hey, Cheryl, did did we get that service? Is it okay to pay that thing? Uh, send the bill over to her desk or or uh, to Tom's desk or whatever. So there's this paper-based um, approval cycle mm -hmm. uh, that takes time, and if somebody's on vacation, it's just not going to work. And then, and so, so what? Instead, what we have now is we just scan it in. It goes up into the cloud. It gets uh, entered automatically uh, in the cloud as a bill, and it gets coded. And it gets. Uh, it doesn't get job costed up there, but it could. You know, it's all about who's entering it. But I can have them actually enter the bill for me. Um, it's synchronized with all my list in QuickBooks, so the cloud knows about my QuickBooks list. So the vendor names, everything. If it's a new vendor, I just add it up there, and then it finds its way down into QuickBooks. Uh, and then, uh, so all the approval cycles are, are electronic. So Cheryl gets an email, please approve this bill, and it's a click. And then it comes to me. It's paid time, uh, and then in fact, I'll pay my bills right now, just like either from the from the road or from here, and literally, I mean, it's it's this fast. I just go in and I'm doing it on the road. I'm doing it anywhere on my phone. I'm just saying, okay, here's all the bills to pay. Click, click, click. Schedule on when to go out, and I never touch the paper, and I never touch it again. And there's the document attached to the transaction, and it mm -hmm. finds its way into QuickBooks automatically. So it's just to me, I mean, maybe that's what. Seth was describing before, but it's mm -hmm. like, duh, everybody needs this. No, so yes, yeah, it, it, it makes such a difference. I love the fact that I can uh, ask people to be set up, like my payees, my vendors, to be set up on ePay, which gives them the opportunity to enter their banking information. Mm -hmm. So that, And I've been on the recipient end of that as well, where it's so nice because the money, once it's paid, you get the notification. First of all, you get the notification, hey, this has been paid. So I'm not in the dark wondering, hey, did they pay it? Excuse me, and then on a few days later, the money just comes into my account. It has made such a difference in terms of the headaches that have previously gone along with collections. And then paying my vendors, I don't have to worry. I know if I've provided the email address, bill.com is going to send them an email when I initiate a payment. I love that. I love the fact that it just it, it, it keeps it takes communications 101 and it sticks it right into the process. Well, I, I think I think you know. Um, we, we we signed up on your bill pay uh, recently, uh, Seth. Yep. You know, and um, it, to be honest, it was great. I, I saw those emails you just spoke about. You mm -hmm. know, so I I knew that you know money had been transferred, and there was no like where's the check or who who uh, you know picked up the check coming through the post. It was just done. You know, notified, and uh, you know we just got on with what we got on with. And that was that was good. This is Dennis. I was at my uh, QuickBooks meetup group last night. And we started talking about payroll, and some people were actually signing payroll checks, bookkeepers, or were approving it. And I saw Bill.com as a way of protecting yourself from the IRS in terms of being a responsible party. If you don't have the authority, if you can't pay them or you can't approve them, you know, I think it gives you some level of protection. 
Yeah. By the way, we have uh, Tim Hughes watching live. He's informed me that he's uh, not prepared for audio, nor is he prepared to be seen this morning. But he mentions that he uses both Bill.com and Smart Vault. That's what Tina says. <laughs> you can see me. There's a nice little picture. <laughs> In a much younger day. Oh, not that long ago. <laughs> Seriously, that was taken in 2006. Cool. That was 2006? Yeah, that that's, was before you I had like my... You look 12. That's what my husband says. <laughs> you do. You look like you're 12. I thought that was. I, I, I thought for sure that was from a long time ago. Not that I think you're that old, but... Yeah, well, I am old, but yeah. <laughs> I, no, thought you were was... more than, I thought you were more than 18. No, that was BS, before Sammy. <laughs> <laughs> That's hysterical. I thought for sure that was you as a kid. No, there's gray hair in there if you get close enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, Roxanne, what do you mean by training, hiring and training people in easy way? Ask that question. Yeah, so I used to have an admin person that came here once or twice a week. And it was great, you know, when you actually did the job. You'd go in and take care of the calendar and the follow-up calls and, um, you know, just all that junk and scanning, filing, and whatever. I let her go a couple of weeks ago. Um, so now when I'm, and she was here five years, so now I need to start this process over. So I'm not sure if I want to have, again, someone coming in or just go with a virtual assistant. A virtual assistant could do everything except filing and scanning. Um, you know, and I was thinking about calling up to the community college, you know, see if um, they've got an intern program or, or whatever. I'm just, Bruce and I have been talking a lot about this in the last couple of weeks because uh, I think from that standpoint, I'm good. Like, I've got him as a resource to send work work out to, but it's more this admin stuff. And, you know, do you bring them in as just admin or do you bring them in thinking that maybe they can learn certain things like, Simple things, how to restore a book file. So one, we know that we've got the files not corrupt and we've got the right passwords. You know, that takes 20 minutes, it's not billable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is good. Um, what I think you're touching on is can we let go of the administrative staff, mm -hmm. and at least that one person that keeps it all together? <laughs> No, I, I want to bring one person in and kind of do it virtually as if it's accessible for other people to do it virtually. So here, you know, here's her email. Because the gal that used to work for me, she didn't come here every day. She came one or two days a week. Sometimes it'd be two or three weeks before she was here. So she just had logins and did everything virtual. But she did come at least a couple times a month. You know, yeah. so like, would it be successful to just go yeah, all virtual I'm, and I'm, have them know what we're doing? Yeah, I'm kind of skeptical that, so I completely buy into the idea of what Adrian's doing where he could be my back office, but can I completely have zero admin support locally with that doesn't see my face and I don't know, know where stuff is? Uh, and so I, I'm um, a little loath to get rid of that, so Nathan in our case, you know, he's out there and man, I'll, I need an envelope created today. Okay, should I do that or can I just... Any well, that's just, that's just it right there, Doug. I think if the, the bottom line on that is if you don't have the time to do it yourself, then yeah, you're going to need somebody that's literally your right hand right there right. with you to help you with tasks like that. Yeah. I, I don't think there's any question about that. You're always like you always say, even when we talk about going to the zero data entry, there's always going to be some babysitting of the data required. And right. in, on an operational level, there's always going to be some babysitting of the operations required, right. no matter how much you outsource and how virtual you go. Here it is. Doug, give us your chunkification pitch. <laughs> I think you guys have already and heard crossing that. the chasm. <laughs> well, that was the um, zero entry uh, thing. Because we'll never get to zero. Look, people are going to watch the recording. We've got, I can see we've got some viewers. People are going to watch the recording. So by all means, uh, spend a few minutes. Talk about it. Well, um, talking about the the uh, sort of the uh, new world of uh, uh, the way all-in-one software like QuickBooks was uh, is becoming what I call chunkified data pro uh, uh, business processes. So Bill.com is a chunk that we just talked about. It takes a huge piece of the business operation, business process. It takes it to the cloud. It takes its efficiency. It takes it to the po possibility of having Adrian do 
my books for me. In fact, our bookkeeper, she's in Toronto. I'm in Pleasanton, California. She, her husband got transferred. She moved, and she's there. We haven't seen her for months, but, uh, you know, I don't. So all of our scans are done here, and, and all of the bill.com bill invoice, you know, vendor invoices are, there, are in the cloud, so she's just dealing with all that. Um, so this chunkification allows us to take pieces of the process and, and uh, I guess, streamline them, and uh, that's bill.com. There's e-commerce for your, you know, uh, shopping cart in your store. There's uh, online banking is a chunkification of the banking process where you can do your reconciliations by connecting online. So those that, that's kind of what I see as the trend that is uh, irrefutable and um, I, I would say irreversible <coughs> but I don't know that for sure um, because I see pendulums happening so where we used to have all-in-one software now if we've got chunks we may find that some of those chunk companies uh, build more and more features and then we'll find ourselves one day <laughs> where that's all where we stay you know and that's our big everything so um, at least it's kind of uh, a way of us getting to the cloud is by taking QuickBooks Desktop where we all live and taking Smart Vault to do our documents and build.com, these chunks uh, in the cloud. So and then zero entry is the other big piece and that is finding ways to just automate the data entry. So the banking feeds where you pull the transactions down into the the software as opposed to beep 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 beep. Uh, I like that sound. My yeah. wife hates it. My wife, every time she goes into my QuickBooks file, she turns it off. She hates it. I love it. I turn it off. I can't take it. The first thing I turn off, I can't stand it. Well, here's the thing to think about, Seth. Every time you hear that song sound, someone is doing manual data entry. <laughs> My wife says it reminds her of Pavlov's dog. Like, but what's the response that it triggers? Does it make you hungry? <laughs> she said it makes me start salivating. <laughs> no. Adrian's got a call. Who's got a call? Adrian. That was, Adrian that was me. Skype, man. That was me. So, you know, one thing that came to mind, Doug, on this topic is if we wanted to really go truly 100% virtual, such that you wouldn't need to necessarily have the person right there. Uh, I think one of the answers, like you gave the example of, all right, I need an envelope made up. Well, what if we were all on the same project management solution where you could just create a new task and go assign it to Nathan. Nathan could be working from home and say, Nathan, go create this envelope for me, right? Well, and then Nathan could chime finger. in and say, you know, you know Nathan's going to get an email notification that he's just been assigned that task. He can go in and post a quick comment saying, I'm on it. I'll have it done in an hour, you know. <laughs> 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 what? But, no, I see your point. Of course, I would have to feed my printer. Oh, yeah, yep. Bruce has it all handled. <laughs> I've got labels to everything going everywhere that I deal with already printed. If I need an envelope, I grab an empty one, stick a label on it, and I'm done. Of course, my question is, what do you need an envelope for, and what are you sending that can't be sent digitally by scanning and what have you? <laughs> Some documents cannot be sent digitally to the IRS. Okay, screw the <laughs> IRS. <laughs> <laughs> Some things like this, hiding the confidential part, unemployment. So, you know, the, the uh, unemployment sends me something that a former employee is claiming you know, unemployment, and so I gotta send in my story. Uh, she quit, so let's. You see know, there's a workaround for that. You just have to hire a couple subcontractors. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I suppose I could, I could scan that and 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 have somebody. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, I'm talking about oh. a special, specialized kind of subcontractor. They usually go by the names Vito and Guido. Yeah, they're all over. He says that he will never need that unemployment again. But, uh, but one, one thing about this virtual, um, or rather, uh, admin uh, staff, is I see lots of job adverts for bookkeeper slash admin. You know, and then and I, I, it makes my blood boil a little bit because I, I keep thinking well bookkeeper is a specialist job and admins another sort of job you know that yes. people put them together um, you know and I, I'd love to be able to go and approach companies that are looking for that saying we can provide both of those talents you know uh, but I don't do that because of this problem with the admin of you know printing uh, envelopes and whatever else an admin does um, you know I can handle the bookkeeping side 
But if I could figure out a way to do virtual admin, that would be that would be great. Yeah. I, I could you know increase what I do. But well, I haven't figured that out yet. And for those of us who want to completely work at home, we really need to be able to go virtual admin uh, because we want people want, want people coming into our house. Right. So mm -hmm. there's a need, and, and we're usually uh, not insured for that. <laughs> well, yeah, and, or the neighbors start complaining. Actually, when when I started the, my company, it was uh, out of my house, and it was for like six years, and we had three employees coming in every day. It was just like <laughs> kind of weird, you know. Well, you, I looked into it. You need technically a home business endorsement policy, which is like a business liability policy to cover for the fact that you you know, in other words, your own homeowners insurance doesn't cover it if you're using your home as a place of business. And it cost me twenty four dollars a month. Yeah. Well, a whole, it's fraught with with danger, uh, mm -hmm. you know, risk, I suppose. But uh, but but everybody's doing it anyway. <laughs> I don't I don't have people come here. There's a few reasons I don't. Besides the sort of obvious liability insurance reasons, there's also I had an experience years ago. I had substantially closed the doors to Nerd Enterprises to go work with a guy as his CFO, mm -hmm. and he was a very vain guy. He has a beautiful home right on the beach in Venice Beach, California. It's like a million and a half dollar home. And he was very proud of it, and so he made sure everybody knew the address. Okay, he had investors in real estate deals that he had going on. When one of those investors got upset, guess where they showed up? And they literally had to call the police. And I was, I, I, I had said to him so many times during the time I was working with him, you know, and I was close enough with him that I could be this candid. And I would say, "You're so stupid, putting your address everywhere. I understand you want the whole world to know that you live in this beautiful home, but it's, you know, you, you're, you're exposing yourself on so many levels." And and he found out the hard way, you know, that he was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep, that's why I'm mad when Facebook changes my um, settings again and puts the maps back on. Grr. <laughs> and puts what back on? Maps. maps. Back on my timeline. Oh, the map? <laughs> yeah. I've disabled it like twice now. But does it show your home? Back. I mean, I don't care if it shows where I go to get a cup of coffee. I just well, don't want my home. I live in such a small town that when it brings that name up, if anyone were to look <laughs> anywhere and find it, you could you could stand literally anywhere in that town and see everywhere else. So yeah. Well, we have a, we have an office. We have a security guard downstairs and uh, offices all around us. So you know we're we're pretty cozy here though. <laughs> I just put my alligator on my Facebook profile to scare people away. <laughs> Well, actually, I do feel pretty secure because I do know everybody in the neighborhood, and I will know at ten minutes before anyone even gets near. <laughs> you know, speaking of the whole paperless virtual thing, I had a very funny conversation not too long ago. You know, Staples is always trying to, as any business should, you know, find ways to sort of up their sales. And so this guy had reached out to me from Staples, saying that he was my new, you know, relationship manager. <laughs> And he was calling because he wanted to know, you know, what sort of supplies I might need. And I knew where he was going. They always go for the ink and the paper. That's what they want to sell you because that's something they can, in the past, they could sell easily and in volume. And I told him, I said, I hate to tell you this, but you're barking up the wrong tree on the ink and paper thing because I use very little of either. And he says, really? I, I said, yeah, I print basically one sheet a week because for some reason my wife still likes to get a check instead of a, a, some kind of a, a wire when she gets what I pay her every week you know, for the help that she gives me. So that's the only piece of paper I actually print is the one check that I still print. I, I haven't ordered QuickBooks checks in like two years because I so rarely print anything. And the guy's like, he was amazed. So, Doug, it reminds me of what you were saying last week. Bruce has got some yummies there, some num-nums. So those are probably go really good after a brownie. Um, Before the brownie, what kind of brownie? <laughs> California brownies. <laughs> we always get you when you're eating. So, uh, here comes. Ted. I'm always eating, so it's not hard to catch me when I'm eating. <laughs> <laughs> 
So anyway, the guy was blown away, and Doug, you were saying this last week, how we're really ahead of most other people in the rest of the country. I mean, when you go to the major cities, yes, everybody's kind of on the cutting edge, generally speaking, but you go to, like, middle America, and they're not nearly uh, up to speed with some of the stuff that we're doing. And this was kind of indicative of that, I think, because he was so blown away when I told him that I was pretty much completely paperless, that I have a printer, but it's an all-in-one, and mostly it goes the other way. I'm just feeding stuff into it to scan things. It's rare that I and if there's any output from this device back here. I would and, hate to be HP LaserJet product manager. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. Well, and then it's funny, Doug, because speaking of, I got a call from somebody from Fujitsu who said, I noticed you're going to be at the Sleater conference, and I'd like to talk to you about our products. I thought that was so funny. Did that bother you, by the way, uh, Seth? <laughs> I don't care. Call? No, that he's, doesn't bother me. I don't. Care he's probably going to sell you a scanner, though. So you yeah. know what? I respect that. I it, it got me thinking. Okay, how can I duplicate that effort in the context of what I'm doing? Like, yeah. You know. Well, but see, then again, if I were in your shoes, Doug, unless for some reason you gave them the okay, <laughs> it would bother me that they're calling my list of people. Yeah, we we actually did. So, but see, help me, guys. I this is one of the struggles we have uh, doing a conference. One uh, for a conference to work, you have. <laughs> Vendors coming in who, you know, pay a ton of money because they want to get to the audience. You know, this is this is a uh, and they actually fund a huge piece of the cost of these conferences. So what do we give them in, in return? You know, the access to the people. How do you get access to it? Well, we want to get to them before the conference so we can tell them what we're going to do and visit us at the booth. Blah blah blah. So we did give them, um, you know, contact information including phone this year. No one has ever called and then two companies are calling this year and yeah, uh, yeah I mean usually the way to handle that I think uh, well I should say the best practice for that kind of thing Doug I think is not to give them the contact information but rather to let them provide you with the content and then you push it out to your own audience yeah and that's a huge bunch of work and then yeah. you become their their weapon <laughs> well, no, not if they provide you with everything. Because in, the in theory, they provide it to you. All you have to do is press the button to send it. You know. Yeah. The yeah. calls you can't really do on their behalf. But it didn't bother me. Uh, yeah. But I'm sure some people get annoyed by it, and you know that's okay. Yeah. There are people who get annoyed by everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some of the people, some of the time. So. Yeah. So Doug, but, are these Doug are these guys um, like sponsoring the event? Is that yeah. what you mean? So yeah. why not just have a link on the the on your home page or the Sleater Group page, it said this event, and then <coughs> link with their icon sponsored oh, yeah. by. Please, you know, go and check them out for mm. you know yeah. helping put this on, and then you don't have to do the admin legwork of it. Yeah, we totally have all that. This is an additional thing, and uh, over the years, we've found that vendors want you know more and more things. And we're always looking for what kinds of benefits to do to really help them succeed. Um, so this is an additional thing that we've been doing for a few years, and it's worked out great because they send postcards, which is the perfect thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you guys got the Zoho postcard if you're met, registered for the. So, but Zoho did this, so they just a nice little postcard, and they just a advertising their product. Of course, it's paper, but that's effective now. <clears throat> this is once again kind of new, new again to to receive something in the mail. You know that's. That, that's kind of weird. It's, it's almost refreshing. It's funny <clears throat> because you think now that's such an old school way of marketing, but now it's almost refreshing. That's why I love send out cards, by the way. Yes. Because send out card gives you an opportunity not just to do that, but to do that with such a nice personal touch that shows you've really gone the extra mile. You're not going to use send out cards to send something out to a thousand people. You're going to send right. something out to one individual. You're going to take the time to, to design it in such a way that it makes it so clear that you really thought about them. Right. Yeah. I I had somebody send one to me, and I was so touched by it uh, that I've started. I, I I sent one to you, Doug. Yes, you did. <laughs> and I was just going to say that. So it's like, yeah, that's the way to cement a more a deeper relationship. Is something as simple as send out cards, which probably took you five minutes to go online and type in this and say send it to Doug. A and they more. do how to find the image and make sure it fit. But yeah, you know, still <clears throat> maybe fifteen minutes. Yeah, on the I first one. But then next time you'll just you've that was probably the first time you used it, right? It was the very first time I had actually used yeah. it to send a card. Yeah. Yeah, and um, yeah, it's um. A, a and then I had to pick the right gift. I had to pick the right cookies. 
Yeah, that's right. That was hard. I still have some of those cookies, by the way, because I am resisting every time I go by. I ate the chocolate chip, though. Well, it seems like restricting the the type of information you send is one way of controlling it. So, you know, I personally can't stand it when people, you know, cold call me and, you know, they're trying to sell me something or tell me about something. If they want to send me an email, then I'll, you know, peruse it at my leisure and delete it. But I don't really want a phone call. Yeah, cold call is different, though. The only reason I think I wasn't annoyed by the Fujitsu call was because she, you know, I was just reading a blog post. I have to find it and post it for everyone because there was a really well-written blog post about how to cold call somebody. It was from the other standpoint. And they made it clear that the first thing you need to do right up front is tell them why you're contacting them, number one, and number two, how you got referred to them or got their information. And she did that. She says, you know, she said, this is so-and-so from Fujitsu Scanners. I saw that you're going to the Sleater Conference, and I thought I would read out to you. Boom, right there and then I'm warmed up because I'm like, oh, she's at Sleater. Great, I'll get a chance to meet her in person. To me, mm -hmm. that touches me on a little deeper level than just somebody calling me random from Staples saying, I'm your new relationship manager. It's like, screw <laughs> your relationship manager. I'll show you a relationship manager. But, <laughs> um, you know, it's so it was warm because there was that common link in, in these be the, the Sleater conference, you know, that we're both going to be there. And I've had, as you can imagine, a ton of people that have reached out to me and that I've been reaching out to saying, oh, you're going to be at Sleater? Yeah, I'm going to be at Sleater. And, you know, this is a testament to Doug's branding of the Sleater conference where, and, you know, we were talking about Intuit's branding and how they protect their brand. And I was thinking about this from our conversation from like two weeks ago. We talked about branding and how Intuit tries to protect their brand by saying you can't use the word QuickBooks in your domain name or any of that. And I thought, when I think of what I've learned recently about branding, what a mistake that is. Because, you know, there's several different levels of brand. And at the first level, people recognize you because they recognize your name. They see, hopefully they see the name Nerd Enterprises, they think QuickBooks training and other software training, right? Um, you know, so you think about your brand and what people think of when they see it and what associations they make. That's level one. Level two, they start recommending your brand to other people. They say, you've got to try this. Level three, they start actually identifying with your brand. So now I'm going out there and saying, I'm a Sleater person, right? So I identify myself as being one and the same with your brand. I'm a Corvette guy, right? If I like yep. to drive a Corvette, let's say, as an example. Yeah. I'm a Sleater guy. I'm a, I'm a Sleater member, right? That's, that's where you've gotten your brand to the most extreme level where it's actually part of somebody's lifestyle and part of how they identify who they are. So to me... That's really the ultimate success in branding is when you have people walking around identifying themselves with your brand uh, in such a way that it makes their, you know, it, it, that's how they, you know, represent themselves. So I think, personally, I think when, when people are out there saying, I'm a QuickBooks person, I'm a QuickBooks pro, right, I've got the QuickBooks Answers site for you, that's the ultimate compliment in terms of branding, I think, as long as they're not making you look bad. But then again, a big brand as big as QuickBooks is, I think most people recognize when it's really QuickBooks and when it's really somebody who just identifies themselves with QuickBooks. So, I think you're right on, Seth. I mean, and marketing is getting harder and harder in this new world where, um, first of all, we don't print uh, big mailings anymore, despite this being special. But this was a small run thing. But it used to be that we'd print hundreds of thousands of flyers and rent a list of names and blast out all this stuff at very high cost. So we don't do that anymore. We never, never do the the uh, marketing of the <coughs> uh, product or service or whatever books. But we have to go online, and then the phone call thing. Uh, is a is a kind of a again it's a special thing anymore to get a phone call from somebody you recognize as opposed to hi I'm from you know uh, timeshare rentals Inc <laughs> Who'd <you> like to talk <laughs> um, but marketing is really changing and but but branding is even more important in today's world than it was uh, because trust is what we're all struggling with do you trust me? And if you do, then you might take the call. <clears throat> if if it, this is Doug Madoff, you might not take the call. You mean Bernie? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, so anyway, the branding is, is critical, and, and uh, Intuit's brand is very strong, and you're right. I, I don't understand quite why they are um, doing what they're doing, other than 
it's a trademark law thing to have to protect your brand from being misused, otherwise you could lose the trademark. Mm -hmm. I think we talked about that two, two weeks ago where you kind of have to defend it, <clears throat> otherwise you lose it. Well, you know, interesting story along those lines. Um, some of you know that I'm a, a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and they had a symbol they were using with a circle and a triangle that they actually had to remove from their basic text for that very reason because other people were using it and representing it in different ways and it was putting them as an organization in a position where they'd have to sue people. So they removed it in order that they wouldn't have to engage in that controversy. They actually just removed that symbol from their branding. Ironically, the symbol wasn't theirs originally anyway. It was based on an ancient Mayan symbol <laughs> that represented body, mind, and spirit. So they had stolen it from an, a, a society that no longer existed and could therefore no longer protect it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's ironic. They ended up being put in a position where they had to protect it, and they don't want to get into controversy, so they said, let's just take it out. So you're on to something, Seth. Um, what we're finding is more and more things like branding are becoming open sourced, uh, mm -hmm. released to the public domain. Uh, think about Wikipedia. Okay, it's high van brand value, right? Because we all trust it, because we know it's not selling us anything. There's no ads on it. It's all free. It's like, what the heck? How could that happen? How is it that we can build a whole computer, uh, except for the hardware costs? We can build it with free software from the operating system all the way through the word processing and even even financials. Yep. Uh, you know, all this free stuff everywhere. So, so in to compete in a world where so many things are free, how do you get them to pay you for whatever it is you're doing? So, how does Google, which most of the things they do are free, become a multi-billion-dollar company? The brand is obviously critical, but then and, and the free stuff that they decide to give, but then all of the things around it become the places where they're monetizing, which is. That's no. the advertising. Advertising, yeah. The yeah. whole internet model is let me build an audience by giving something away for free, <clears throat> and then basically I can sell advertisers on the fact that I have that audience. Basically, uh -huh. I'm selling eyeballs to advertisers, and right. that's what it is. That's my real product is eyeballs. Yep. And I'm selling that to the advertisers, saying I've got this. I've got this suite of Office documents that are online. People are converting from Microsoft to Google Docs, so I've got all these people in there. Hey, advertiser, why don't you come in and let me? You know, imagine if the day comes when I'm working in a Google Doc and all of a sudden ads appear. <laughs> I mean, I think I would hate it, but at the same time, I would respect it. <laughs> you know, from a business standpoint. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like ads, contextual Google. ads. I'm writing a Google Doc. I'm writing an angry letter to my wife, and I get anger <laughs> management ads. <laughs> That's funny. You write angry letters to your wife. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I kid. Uh, I know. Hey, uh, can I change the subject slightly? Um, yes, you can. Only slightly. It's still very related. Have you guys ever done anything with uh, digital wallets? No. This concept of this being my wallet as opposed to this, I really think this is where we're going. I've seen uh, that more and more at Starbucks where people, I don't even know what the app is yet, but well, they're I using just, your phone mm, to pay. That's exactly my example. So let me go into the Starbucks app. So... And uh, you get this app. Basically, you have a login. Uh, and what I did with this is I went to the store physically the first time, and I bought a uh, Starbucks gift card. So I put 15 bucks on Starbucks. Mm -hmm. Gave them the 15 bucks, and uh, they gave me a physical card. Now this is still old. Well, later, I don't need to do that physical card. But for now, you just get that card. Go in, set up your account, put in the card number and the PIN, and now I've got 15 bucks sitting on, on here. Now, when I want to spend it, I basically, or reload it, there's a reload money button and a manage button. Hopefully you can see. Is that, can you kind of see it? Yep. So when I go get the coffee, they're going to, uh, I'm going to basically just say, you know, click over here and it's going to send touch to pay touch to pay I clicked 
and now there's a little scannable thing. So at the POS, they're going to just scan this, and it's going to pull the money off my card, and we're done. What happens if somebody so, steals your iPhone? Well, it's well, no different than having your what, wallet stolen, though. What, what do you want? Which would well, you rather steal? Well, there's way more in there than your wallet, though. I mean, no, but this has out. Find My iPhone. Right. And this has a lock and key behind it. This doesn't. There's no mm -hmm. way I could give the security to this that I could to this. Can you make it self-destruct if somebody tries to enter something <laughs> in? Sure. No, but you know, you know what's funny? Yeah, a friend yeah. of mine, a friend of mine has an app on the iPhone. I'll talk to him and find out what it is. This is the coolest thing. Talking about the security, where if you steal his iPhone, um, it, there was something that it did, which led you to believe that you were getting access to the phone. Actually, it led you to believe you were getting access to his passwords. It was like an app that said passwords or something that seemed like it would have that kind of information. And once you access that app. It actually launches a locator using the GPS tracking so that he could go on his computer and actually track down wherever it is that the person's got his phone. Right. Yeah, they just called a guy here in DC using mm. that. <laughs> he swiped some money off the metro. Right. Well, already you can turn on Find My iPhone, which is a standard feature that you yeah. can have turned on, and it's it's always able to be found by an app that you log into the internet. And you can say, find my iPhone. And it knows your phone and your ID there. And so it's somewhere, I think, in <laughs> general. Yeah, it sends an alert, though. What it does is it automatically sends the alert to, to wipe the iPhone and do the locator and send you an alert. Mm -hmm. So it's in addition to the... Uh, right. So, and, of course, so even if I can't recover the physical device, I could wipe it. That, right. How could I ever get anything close to that with this? True. So... We, we have to be relative when we say, oh, that's dangerous. This is dangerous. Right. right. It's, it's less dangerous. <laughs> Doug, show us the back of your phone. Uh, I've seen yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I got brand, this, branding and advertising. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Brand. I got it from the Rene Lassert, who founded the company, Bill.com, and he also founded PayCycle, the payroll company. Um, and uh, he had one, and I said, I want one of those, and he didn't have any more, so he gave me his. <laughs> wow. Now, is that just a sticker, or is it the whole iPhone cover? Yeah, it's the whole shroud. Okay. Cool. See, that's what we need, Doug. We need, we need sleeter uh, iPhone and there toy covers. <laughs> that's, that, yeah, that's a good, good uh, tchotchke for giveaway. What I find with these things is once we get one, it's kind of even hard to remove. People very sticky. <laughs> <laughs> um, and actually, that's another thing. A lot of the uh, exhibitors, uh, they want to know, what should we give away? And one of the coolest things people give away are luggage tags. Mm -hmm. You know, how many people see luggage tags? Even though you, you don't really think about it. And you put a luggage tag on there, and it's there for 10 years. So, kind of a cool little branding thing. But anyway, or, I, I think the key I want to... Oh, with a <laughs> suction cup that sits on your desk and bobbles around. <laughs> oh, I thought that was Pez. <laughs> Look at Pez. Yeah. yeah. I have but, one of those. <laughs> yeah. But I think the whole digital wallet thing is, I think, you know, I think we're all going to have to deal with this. Because, so Starbucks can do it because they're a big company that has a lot of resources to do it. And they can put it all the way down to the POS. But now, you know... Uh, ABC Jewelry Store down the street should do it too, and, and it will be through all sorts of technologies that you and I are going to have to learn about. There's something called Google Wallet that you guys should go start learning about. Mm -hmm. I'm still drinking from a fire hose on this too, mm -hmm. but uh, one thing is the wallet side. The other side is our clients. What are they going to do to accept payments this way? Sorry, we don't take Google Wallet. No, that's not going to be an acceptable answer later. Because I can actually load on on Google Wallet, I can a I load in my Amex and my Mastercard and Visa. Uh, so really, I'm here instead of uh, of, of here. And um, so someday we're going to laugh that we actually got these things, you know, uh, actually in the mail, which are so so freaking insecure. 
Yep. I mean, look, yeah, there, stop showing your card on. there, Doug. Yeah, <laughs> rolling <laughs> number there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you've got this over all over the internet. That's just as insecure as it gets. So um, we're going to laugh that we ever had these things well, within, like, I would say five years at least, at most. Uh, and everybody's going to say, well, why would you put your money in a physical thing instead of in here? That's my little oh, The biggest fear, and this is the irony of the whole cloud security question, Doug, is everybody thinks it's so it's, it's insecure to have your information in the cloud. Ironically, they don't realize how much more secure it is, you know, right. to use these kinds of things. Because mm -hmm. that's the fear is, oh, somebody gets my phone, they're going to have access to my money. But yeah. if you lock your phone and make it so that a code has to be entered, which every phone has that ability, that's the first step in protecting your stuff. Bye, right? Roxy. And, 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 and Bye, Roxy. you know, then... You know, plus, Doug, I might have missed it because I might have been responding to something. Um, but when you talked about the Starbucks app, do you have to do anything special to use it? Or if I got your phone, and assuming I got into your phone, could I go and get my Starbucks with it? Yeah, no, there's a login. So when I first yeah. launched the app, it, it asked for my... Well, actually, I, I think I told it to remember my login, so no. I just uh, clicked open. Oh. Well, <laughs> is this $15 right, so we'll on it. That's the, Next time yeah. I get the pleasant Coffee's on Doug. <laughs> <laughs> Up to fifteen dollars. This is why yeah. Ash is still king. Hmm? But that's there, that's just it though. You you, you keep fifteen dollars on a Starbucks thing. Your banking information hopefully is secure. Hopefully you haven't remembered your passcode to your banking app on your phone. Um, Bill.com, I noticed, is the minute I click away from it or close a tab or close the, the thing on my browser, I have to log back in. There's no grace period. Yeah. You know, just like share file, as soon as I close it, I'm logged out. So I like that kind of security, obviously, for that sort of thing. Right. So, and that's the whole key. Like, I don't keep any money in my PayPal account. I sweep it every single day. I leave $100 in there. That's the most anybody's going to get from me if they get access to my PayPal account. Yeah, and uh, maybe that's how your rules are with this, too. Although, how could you limit what you keep in here? You could keep only a hundred dollars in cash but could you keep I mean that thing is wide open well I know certain ones of that thing that only have a certain limit and I'll use those for certain things that I'm not so sure are secure mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I always keep a thousand in cash for hookers <laughs> in, in, your, in your wallet. TMI. <laughs> I couldn't resist that one. <laughs> and on that note, it's 9 o'clock. Yeah. 9 o'clock, and we do I have something. Shout out for Molly Clark. She was chatting to me. She said she forgot how to get in. It's been so long since she's been here. So I Who's gave that? her some instructions. Molly Clark. Molly Clark. I'll make sure that she's in my ABO circle. Okay. I'm pretty sure she is. That's what I said. So hopefully and next we'll week, her. I think uh, my friend Tim Hughes will be joining us, hopefully, live. Molly, if you can hear me, send me a message, because I just searched Molly Clark, and believe it or not, there's like 10 of you. No, there you are. <laughs> so, yeah, it looks like, oh, no, you, you know what? Molly, I had you in two other circles. I didn't have you in that one, probably because I haven't seen you in a while. I just added you in. You'll get the invite next week for sure. But if, for those of you, you know, if you don't get the invite, like some of us have been doing, just ping me on the chat, and I can send you a direct invite. Because for some reason, it seems like people aren't seeing it. The other thing is, go to my profile. You should certainly see where I've initiated the Hangout there. It'll be the most recent post. Hey, Doug, quick question for you about Salita Conference. How many uh, exhibitors are there? There's 57, I think, right now. But usually and we get it like 60. Right. Are you normally uh, are you normally splitting the conference between the conference actual side of it and the exhibitor side of it? Um, yeah. So people can go to one or the other or both. Uh, no, it's all it's all together. Uh, we don't have an exhibits only, if that's what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Because I I'm just I was wondering about that because most of the conferences I've go to, you know, at least you know you can do both or you can just do the exhibitor side of it. That's all. Yeah, we've considered that a lot, and I'm never done considering things like that, but. Uh, it's an educational conference that has exhibit time to go look at the, the exhibit hall. 
And mm -hmm. our audience is very much like all of us in this room, very engaged with, they want to know every product, they go to every booth, they spend time there. So we, we, we reserve, you know, I don't know, is it nine hours or something in the three days to just mm -hmm. hit the exhibits. Mm -hmm. um, but we also want them to be able to come to the sessions and not, you know, uh, have to, uh, you know, uh, either or it. Right. right. I see. Okay. But I assume by your question that you would maybe want to be one of those that would just go to the exhibit. Is that what you're uh, Well, yeah, yeah, yes, and at some point perhaps be an exhibit ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what yeah. that's what I was that you know beginning to think, you know, in the coming year or so. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe next year. So uh, just go to Sleater dot SleaterConference dot com and you'll see there's a, a, an exhibit uh, place to go. Yeah. Uh, you can see all the different things we do for exhibitors. But um, you we know, have an, ab an abo table as well. <laughs> yeah, well, we could. So the, the 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 thing that makes something like this work is um, both. The, the products are what we all come to learn about, but we also come to learn about digital wallets, which isn't going to have a booth, you know. So uh, I'm trying to always present both of it. We got to go talk like we're talking here, and then we got to go look, and we got to meet the people who are behind those products. So mm -hmm. it's a very, uh, you know. Well, no, the way I was thinking is, you know, we're a service business, and I want to be able to be a service business to other uh, bookkeepers, other service providers, mm -hmm. you know, as, we, as we said at the beginning of uh, the Hangout. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, we should definitely talk offline too. Uh, I know, I don't know if you and Seth have been talking about. This. Yes, we have. Yeah, we have. It. By the way, for those of you who haven't signed up for the Sleater Conference yet, sign up because I'm going to be speaking about social media. I'm also going to be emceeing a panel on a QuickBooks deep dive, and we're also going to be doing a panel with Ruth Perryman, talking about applications that help you syndicate your content in social media. Plus. I'm giving away T-shirts and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. <laughs> Just saying. But are you taking the monkey with you? I, I, I will take the monkey with me. Will you bring? Will you bring Ralphie? <laughs> will I bring Ralphie? Will the Marriott allow pets? I don't know. <laughs> I know Marriott courtyards do, but I don't know about the conference center in Anaheim. That might be pushing it. We can try. What I would bring Ralphie. That would be awesome. Ralphie, well, you want? To come to this leader conference? Road he's trip. Away. He's like, no way. <laughs> oh, where's Nancy? <laughs> yeah, where's well, Nancy she posted today? in the group that she wasn't going to be able to make it. Well, darn, because I just wanted to remind us all, she was a uh, exhibitor at our very first conference in 2004. No kidding. Wow. Yeah, so nice. she goes way back with us. and um, I want Leader to, trivia. Yep. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for doing this, uh, Seth. Again, this was a great session. I hope it got recorded. This will probably be the one that didn't record. <laughs> Murphy's live. Bye, I noticed it Have wasn't great... there on my YouTube channel to bring it up live. That's actually why I'm saying that because I I was not able to bring it up live. So I'm a little concerned, but it does say it's broadcasting and we've got viewers and so because this was probably one of the better sessions we've had, you know, just in terms of we kind of instead of me clowning around, I did flex for everyone. <laughs> yeah, you got that. Yeah. But all right, I got to go. I got to be uh, yep. I got to be at my interior designer client by 10. Oh. Oh, Fire wonderful. Client. Okay. And by the way, I, that was last week's Hangout. I put that up on my Hangout gallery on my site, and I called it the interior design episode because that was <laughs> a hot topic last week. Yeah. Uh, great. Okay, All right, kids. Okay. Have a great weekend. See you. Bye. See you. Have a great Bye. weekend. Bye. Don't forget Bruce's tax Hangout on Tuesday. Nancy's Hangout.